Hi, everyone. We'll get started shortly. Hi everyone, thanks for joining us today for this Design for Scientists 101 webinar. I hope you guys are excited because it's gonna be pretty interesting, this is very new. And we're gonna just start off with giving you sort of a big picture of like why this matters to SDR while, uh, while we're thinking of how to create or how to solve big challenges with impactful projects. So I want everyone to know that we're, you can tweet at us at Open Watersheds and use the hashtag design for scientists and that's listed on uh, the slide right in front of you. But please feel free to also type in the chat window if there's any questions or concerns. I hope everyone can hear me just fine. So if, uh, if there's any problem, just make sure you message in the chat window and I'll try to correct it. Thanks, this is Sujata speaking. And we're going to just jump into the agenda. Uh, or, well, let me introduce everyone first, I guess. So our speakers today will be Kate Marr, uh, an associate professor of the Earth System Science at Stanford University, followed by Dr. David Moulton, who is a scientist at Los Alamos National Lab, and Dr. James Stegan, who's an Earth scientist at Pacific Northwest National Lab. Um, with us today is Paul Baer, uh, the SDR Program Manager at Department of Energy, Biological and Environmental Research in the Climate and Environmental Systems Science Division. Uh, and my name is Sujata Imani. I'm a AAAS Science and Technology Policy Fellow, uh, uh, staffing, I guess, at CER this year, specifically in the Biological Systems Science Division, and Jessica Mormon, who's on, our, on the call who has also been instrumental in working with SDR and transforming uh, what we're, what, this kind of creative energy that we're infusing into SDR this year, who's also a AAAS fellow in the climate, uh, climate environmental system science side. So our agenda is, well, you got, you're welcome from me. And we're gonna start off with uh, a little comments, from, a few comments from Paul Bayer talking about what, why do we care about openness? Why do we care about design-led design thinking for SDR? Followed by some testimonials, so to speak, from Kate Marr, David Moulton, and James Stegan, telling us how maybe design thinking has changed how they've done their science, as well as some projects they're going to feature uh, that they've used design thinking, or at least are trying now to use design thinking to develop further and to increase, to specifically increase their impact. And finally, Kate's gonna lead us through a design exercise that hopefully will give everyone a taste of how design thinking is, kind of works and how you can use it as a scientist. And we'll finally take your questions at the end and we hope you will have many um, and we'll try to answer as many of them as possible today. 
but there'll be a survey after and you can also enter your questions into that survey and we will uh, try to kind of create a FAQ sort of uh, document that everyone can have access to. But again, uh, whatever questions you're gonna ask, make sure you put it into the chat window and I will keep track of those as we go on. So uh, to get started, let's uh, jump into Paul Bear's talk. One second. Well, while Sujata is bringing that up, why don't I just go ahead and get started because I think you can uh, see at least the, the slides here. So uh, thanks, Sujata. Um, and uh, you already did a little bit of introduction for me. Um, I should say that <clears throat> I'm uh, just one of the program managers uh, for the SBR program. Um, we also have Amy Swain. Um, yes, we've lost uh, David Lesnus to USGS, but he may be on actually the call. Um, and we've uh, got Jessica Mormon also as a AAAS fellow, um, who's particularly helping us out in the SBR program. Uh, so <clears throat> what, um, what you'll hear uh, over the next hour or so is um, kind of, uh, I'll, I'll put it as preparation for the upcoming ESSPI meeting, which uh, I know a number of you will attend. I, I believe there's some of you that won't be able to attend, um, but that will be at the end of April, beginning of May. And um, we're actually going to have a, a town hall um, during the meeting that's uh, going to build on some of the things that you'll hear today. So let's go to the next slide. Um, so just a little bit, um, as uh, you might, those of you involved in the program probably know, this uh, is an older slide of you know, the structure of the SBR program um, a number of years ago. Um, the point of putting this up is that <clears throat> You know, for a long time we've been doing um, research at the um, molecular and genomics level and, you know, uh, trying to understand uh, processes uh, in the biogeochemical processes at sort of small scale field sites, you know, whether it's floodplains or maybe a contaminant plume or that sort of thing. Um, we've engaged all of our SFAs or science focus areas um, and user facilities in that and we've also engaged um, uh, to some degree uh, modeling in terms of uh, computational biochemistry or reactive transport modeling and, and doing that kind of work. Right, the next slide. Um, but <clears throat> kind of going forward in terms of more recent uh, uh, last few years, um, we've been focusing on um, what we're calling watershed system science uh, for energy to um, address a number of uh, DO needs in sort of the water and energy um, security area. And we still are doing uh, funding research at the molecular and genomic scale, but um, we've extended um, at the sort of larger um, uh, spatial scale, certainly, and uh, to some degree um, a temporal scale, uh, the scope of the research that we're supporting. Um, and the overall uh, effort is focusing on advancing a mechanistic understanding of hydrobiogeochemistry that extends from the plume scale, the watershed scale, eventually to the uh, Kona scale. So next slide. Uh, so <clears throat> this slide is also one that a number of you have seen before. Um, what I wanted to talk about here uh, is particularly on the right side. Uh, that you know the focus of the research uh, that we support is on uh, going extending from sort of the mechanistic uh, hydrobiogeochemistry all the way up to um, integrated system behavior and what we're after is uh, trying to get a handle on not only the structure and function uh, but also the dynamics of, of watershed systems next slide so <clears throat> over the years um, we've <clears throat> made use of a number of, of field sites um, and uh, these larger ones at the Hanford site at East River, uh, East Fork Poplar Creek um, <clears throat> are engaging uh, integrated, what we call integrated watershed studies relevant to, uh, you know, water quality, uh, water quantity, um, contaminants, and, and nutrient cycling. Um, let's go ahead to the next one. We've also, uh, of course, made use um, of our user facilities, JGI and EMSOL, more recently um, engaging KBase, um, and <clears throat> we've 
continue to uh, undertake research uh, from this small scale all the way up to the um, to the watershed scale um, and incorporating our data into um, a data archive called ESS Dive, which I won't go into. Um, but more recently, um, some work that um, I believe James Steger will talk a little bit about, um, uh, sort of an effort that he initiated under the PNNL SFA called Wonders, um, was a new effort to um, uh, collect, if you will, data and make those data uh, available beyond the um, current test beds that we have in the SBR program. Let's go ahead to the next slide. And similarly, in terms of our modeling, and David Moulton will, will talk a little bit about this, um, we have uh, traditionally come from a background where we had sort of siloed uh, codes that we have uh, been working with, with David and his team uh, to integrate uh, those codes to um, create more of an ecosystem of code so that um, they are they are interoperable and um, depending on your science question you might use components of, of particular codes and that I'll just leave it at that for a moment so one of the things that um, is sort of a characteristic of, of our DOE test beds if you look at this sort of red arrow um, here through the uh, blue planes um, the, the DOE uh, test beds that we have in the subsurface program really provide us a great deal of depth of, of uh, research in, you know, specific uh, locations. Um, whereas other agencies are doing research um, at, at maybe multiple locations um, and, and they're looking at, you know, sort of specific things. Um, let's, go to the, let's go to the next slide here. So what we've come to recognize is that um, on this left side of the slide here, um, you know, for us to really get a handle on sort of watershed system structure, function, and dynamics, um, we really need to go kind of beyond our, our DOE test beds. And one of the things that um, came out just in 2018 was a um, National Academy report uh, called Open Science by Design. Um, that's uh, in part um, very uh, analogous to um, some of the things that, that James started in, the, in his wonders uh, in his wonders effort, um, but actually goes beyond that. And um, I won't really dwell on that this report very much, um, other than to say it sort of influenced us to be thinking about what we are calling uh, open watersheds by design, and um, we believe this will enable us to go from our few test beds to multiple sites. So you're going to hear from, um, from James um, a little bit more on sort of the watersheds data and from David Moulton on um, sort of some of the, the modeling efforts as I mentioned earlier. But the sort of new part here in the, by design, and that's sort of the whole uh, focus of this, of this webinar, you're going to hear from Kate um, because uh, Kate uh, is in the, the D school, design school at Stanford, and um, she actually ran um, a very interesting, fun uh, workshop for us last year um, to uh, where she, um, she and her husband employed the design principles um, to uh, get us all thinking about how to um, design, better design our, our science research. And um, so you're going to hear next from Kate. Um, so I, I will turn it over to her. Um, and I forgot to say that um, I wanted to thank Sujata, uh, who's kind of moderating this. And she will also, at the upcoming SBR Town Hall, she will also moderate um, with, with uh, James and with Kate and David Moulton um, at, that, uh, at that Town Hall also. So with that, let me just end here and turn it over to Kate. Thanks, Paul. Switch over once more. I'm Kate Maher. I'm an associate professor of Earth System Science and an affiliated faculty member in the D School. I think the moment when 
when I realized I really wanted to learn more about design thinking was when you connected me with Carissa. So Carissa Carter is the uh, director of teaching and learning at the B School, and she's interesting because her background is that she was originally a geologist. And Carissa interviewed me and really unpacked a lot of tensions that I had around teaching and, and how I was teaching and how I designed teaching and the amount of preparation it took to teach well versus um, the, the pressure we have from other uh, angles. And she designed an experiment for me to participate in just, just based on these insights that she pulled out of me from an hour long interview. And the experiment was just to take my normal isotope geochemistry class, so this like very detailed upper level undergraduate graduate class, and teach it in d-school spaces where there were no seats, uh, only whiteboards, and that ended up really being a profound experience for me, and that made me realize that you know there was a lot in there in terms of how she had developed insights from just listening to me talk about how I approach teaching and created this experiment that then led me to have some new insights into, into how I teach. I think the big transformation was being open to experimenting with new ways of doing things. And so the experiment that we had at the D school was that I showed up one day and I was in a class called the concept car where there, you know, this, this room, but there were no seats. There were hanging whiteboards. And I had to teach what would have normally been a chalkboard lecture uh, with, without the infrastructure to do it. And so it really forced me to improvise and experiment. And that experiment then worked really well. And I've continued to revise that. And so now I think with my teaching, instead of feeling like I have to have everything perfect the first time, I've adopted much more of a prototyping, learn from that, revise it the next time, get, try to get as much feedback as I can from the students about what worked and didn't work, what worked and didn't work and take that into the next iteration to make it better. And that's been a really uh, fun and more flexible way of teaching for me. Tense. I would say I felt like I put a lot into preparation and I'm just not naturally an entertainer, and so I just felt like I was putting a lot into preparation, not getting engagement back from the students. I felt kind of frustrated by it, and it just felt like I was put into um, a pair of pants that were the wrong size. Like that was how I felt about teaching, and I think shifting to the way of you know what I now call um, experiential class notes, like it has put me into a position where I'm really comfortable. I get to have small group interactions with the students. Um, and that's fun for me, and I enjoy that. I think they enjoy it. I remember one of my students said to me once that this was the one class he never wanted to end, and that was just you know, a change, sea change for me from I think everyone in the room wanting it to end to having the students actually be happy to stay in class and to be participating in a different way. So that was really a huge change for me. I would say that the biggest shift for me has been, in some sense, analogous to the shift in teaching, which is really starting to get ideas out early, get feedback on them, like much more about openness, getting feedback and viewing every idea as a prototype. That's just a starting point, and it will get better if we let people engage with it and collect that feedback and use it meaningfully. And so I think that can sometimes be hard because it requires you to shift from this position of my only putting an idea forward when you know it's really good to saying, well, you know, I don't know, is this a good idea? Let's let's workshop this with a group of people who we trust and, and make it better. And so now bringing that into collaborations and creating a structure that everyone has that, that mindset has been what I've been trying to work on and that's been really fun and I think um, is a, is a good way to, to, to see design in the context of science because it is about um, you know engaging lots of people, getting feedback early, prototyping, learning from others, bringing all of these kind of classic design principles and abilities into, into the scientific aspect. I 
interesting question. I think there's a lot of discussion now about how hard it is to come up with new ideas, and I think a lot of that is because there are there is so much information out there. You have to synthesize it, and it requires that we have interdisciplinary teams and people that are just bringing in that knowledge and information from lots of different sectors. And so the only way I really see for us to keep advancing science is that we do it collaboratively and we do it in an open way because no single one person could possibly digest the history of science as well as the current context of science. And so I think that that ability to see a direction, but then really like zoom in on that direction with like, in a collaborative way with input from lots of different disciplines is really critical to how we do science. And that's why I think this movement towards open science is potentially really powerful for the community. Yeah, I think the, the recent one was an NSF proposal to an interdisciplinary program called Frontier Research in Their Systems. And this was intended to draw from all of the different domains represented by the Geosciences Directorate at NSF. And so um, and it has to be interdisciplinary, and you have to demonstrate transform transformative science. And so pulling together a team to work on this, I think, was a great way to just experiment with, with how we can work more collaboratively together and really develop ideas together instead of just everyone having their one idea that they're working on, which is often how we do it. And so some experiments that I did with the group didn't work so well, and I just iterated on those and found some things that did work well. And so a couple of things that we tried, we focused a lot on just spending time learning about each other's science, and that was really productive because we had some really deep conversations about what different models can do, what different data sets can tell us, and that brought everyone together. And then I tried to do some kind of group brainstorming uh, virtually, which turned out to work really well. And I, I basically collected what I thought were our goals and objectives and had enough resolution that people could engage with them. And I put that onto a Google Doc and then Everyone went on and started working through the objectives, either rewriting them in their own words or playing around with what were the dependent independent variables that we would be working with. And that really also helped to bring out a lot of tensions that we had as a scientific community, just really different views, even though I mean, you wouldn't necessarily think that a hydrologist and geomorphologist would have, you know, non uh, it wouldn't have overlapping views of a lot of discrepancies in how people viewed the, the scientific questions and goals. And so that was a really nice way to just create convergence, but also to get everyone's ideas. And so then finally, you know, we felt like we could start moving the ideas forward. And that was, I think, a very different way from approaching an interdisciplinary project. Often it's approached as very top down with the lead on the project, have some ideas that they want to address, and everyone comes up with their own kind of sub ideas. and you write a proposal around those sub ideas and what we really wanted was a package that was cohesive together and that all of the questions were really integrated and so it was clear that it wasn't just you know five people working at the same site it was groups of people connected in interesting ways with a lot of connective tissue among them to, to actually approach the question I really like the movement that people are putting towards open science and having some metrics for, for what openness means in science and being really intentional about designing our scientific endeavors to, to be more open and to be more collaborative. If I had to talk about what I think the future looks like, I hope that's the future, but as far as getting there, I think that we really need to experiment in the ways that we're working. I think that, you know, at least this was the way that I was. I knew one way of collaborating, one way of doing science, and that was the way that I learned from my PhD advisor who learned it from his PhD advisor. And I never really thought, how could we do this different, differently and more effectively? And so I think having both the scientific community experimenting, but also bringing in people from other domains, from from business, from team science, that can help us really to 
to change our workflow and structure our interactions to be more productive and train people in train people in collaboration, I think that that is one of the really key paths forward. The other thing I would say is that it takes a lot of time and, and what I see happening is this emphasis on efficiency and do more for less and everyone is scattered between so many projects and I think that that ends up being really ineffective and that we don't take the time that we need to take to develop a collaboration and there's lots of dimensions around collaboration from trust, openness, um, you know, norms that really have to be developed and so I think as long as we continue to try to do more with less I don't think we'll really achieve the full potential of the concept of open science and I think that will be a really key transformation is you know what I, what I think of as you know slowing down science so we can move it faster and I think that is a really important transformation that has to happen. What I'm suggesting is we need to bring the scientific method to bear on the scientific process. Be open to being a little bit uncomfortable and being open to failure. You know, we're all experimenting with this and some things may work well, some things may not, but I think if everyone approaches it with the mindset of, of wanting to learn new ways of working and, and being open to a process and engaging, I think everyone will lead with something that they can take back into their practice and, and continue to develop over time. Interesting question. I found in the example I gave of this collaboration that the thing that was really different for me about it was that it was really fun. And I think everyone on the team was having fun. We were having two hour Friday phone calls and I would literally have to like cut it off because people still wanted to keep talking and working. And a bunch of us even felt like after we submitted the proposal and we stopped having the Friday phone calls, we all felt this absence in our work from not having these really deep two hour phone calls where the discussions were, you know, really insightful, but also lighthearted and fun. And we felt like we were really communicating across different disciplines. And I think one of the questions you asked me earlier was is a really important one, which is I don't remember the exact question. I think it was what can design do for you or what can it not? And I think the important thing for people to remember is that design is not a magic wand that will transform you or your organization. Just like if we follow the scientific method, it doesn't mean that we'll do amazing science. And if you dig into to how we do amazing science, it's really about the abilities that we use and the way that we connect the different components of the scientific process and so I would encourage people I think people should should be aware of the fact that it's not just the design process it's about the abilities of learning from others synthesizing information moving from concrete to abstract communicating deliberately that really make design unique and in calling out those abilities it makes it clear that we all can continue to develop them and that they are really the same abilities that make us good as scientists. They're just being, we're just being intentional about them when we use them in a design context. Uh, imagine you're at a cocktail party. How would you introduce yourself there? <laughs> I'm Kate Maher and I figure out how to make Earth great again. <laughs> that. Cool. <laughs> so thanks to Kate for uh, Kate and um, her spouse Matt Ross for making that great video that I hope
uh, brought you the inspiration as well as a couple of laughs and maybe some curious looks, um, something different than you're used to hearing about. So we're going to uh, turn it right over to David Moulton. Uh, David, if you're ready with uh, your screen share, please go right ahead. And your audio. Hold on a second. I think we have to unmute David. Go ahead, David. Now you're good. Sorry about that. Uh, thanks. Okay, can everybody hear me now? Yeah. Yeah, is the volume okay? All right. Thanks, everybody. So I'm just uh, going to give you a quick uh, perspective uh, from what we've been learning through first ideas and now ideas uh, watershed follow on project on how we sort of started uh, out more or less in the agile world of trying to worry about software methodologies and development and productivity and enriching that further with some design thinking. And I don't really have time to go in a lot of detail about the project, but um, just the, the sort of mantra or, or real aligning narrative is, is that we're trying to accelerate watershed science through a community-driven software ecosystem. And Paul alluded to what that is, and I'll talk a little bit more about what it is. Um, and it's really, it's really about trying to address this new interdisciplinary science challenges that, that Kate alluded to, and, and really trying to ensure scientific productivity for all of us that are involved with that effort. Um, it touches essentially on the science focus areas. It forms partnerships essentially with the focus areas that Paul alluded to, the test beds. Um, and so it lives in, in roughly across three sort of cornerstones or scales from reaction networks to watersheds. To continental hydrology, and and that's really we're trying to su support the software ecosystem to support the research in those areas. So this is the slide that Paul showed uh, earlier. It tries to uh, demonstrate sort of graphically how we view the evolution of the the codes and the tools that we use uh, within SBR BR science. We really started out with codes that were very siloed. And monolithic. Um, over time, as open source started to develop and more tools were made available, then we did start to see the use of libraries with these silos, but they were still very much sort of silos. Um, and what we've been really striving to do is transform those silos uh, in, into something more generic that we call host codes, which can hold components. So we we recognize the importance of the sort of branding and autonomy that those silos brought with them and all the effort that went into developing those, but we're now kind of decomposing them and worrying about how to, to build a much more open and sharing community environment and more efficient uh, development to reuse and not duplicate uh, as, as things were done in the past. So that's in a nutshell um, what we think of as a software ecosystem. It should, the word ecosystem should conjure up the right kind of image of things that are very flexible and adaptive uh, over time. And, uh, and progress sort of naturally in a, in a grassroots fashion, much less top-down, much more autonomy and kind of grassroots. So with this in mind, um, we, we can uh, kind of explore how we've been, been doing this evolution. So we started out with trying to, you know, for, first we really started out with the idea that we had all these um, capabilities and, and, and algorithms and advances that we wanted people to use, and we just sort of thought, well, if we build it, um, surely people will will come and use it. Um, and that, of course, is a, is a little bit of a misnomer. Um, there's a lot more to reaching out to to folks to to demonstrate the value of of what is being developed. And so as we gradually worked through and started to use um, more and more modern tools and methodologies, 
and express and, and learn more about sort of agile development approaches in the agile manifesto we kind of moved from just using the the tools which are kind of highlighted on the left so you know we've sort of had the obvious kind of well everything moved to open source and we, we created a business model around open source and open science we use tools such as github uh, gitlab others you know source code repositories we definitely develop test-driven development and can use integration testing and we're worried about deployment and using cloud and other resources so kind of things like docker those are all kind of examples of tools um, and we and we adopted very much an agile and iterative approach so much as you hear with design with science with everything um, we dispensed with the sort of waterfall notion focused on iterative development focused on the way new tools could enable the community but that still kind of was not quite enough. Um, we realized we really needed this outreach. We really needed to have a notion of, of somebody actually really using and seeing the, the developments in action um, and also to focus the development to make sure it was useful. And that, that led to this development of use cases within the first phase of the ideas project where we really made sure we were connected to science challenges. Um, and that we could demonstrate progress on those science challenges through the capabilities that were developed. And it added the constraints that these capabilities would have to be done in both a sustainable and flexible way, but also be effective and, effective and transferable across science applications and the, and the various sites and teams that we were trying to service. So this was, this was going pretty well. I think it did go very well. Um, last year, we started to think that um, maybe there were maybe there were things we were missing or maybe there were things we should be be doing uh, and we participated in the ideas or we participated in the um, collaborative design workshop and sure enough as we move forward with the the second phase of ideas and, and developing the ideas watershed project we soon realized we were missing something we we started developing our use cases and our partnerships for this second phase uh, focusing first on the larger test beds that were mentioned earlier, the ones that kind of spanned across different stream orders uh, and different watersheds in, in the continental US. And we had already extended kind of out to the continental um, hydrology, Kona scale. And we thought we were, we were you know, pretty confident we knew what we were doing. Um, we had liaisons with these projects. We had some ongoing collaborations and participated in various uh, team building exercises with these projects so we kind of knew what was going on but um, when it came to developing concepts for the additional SFAs that we didn't know so well uh, the ones that were working primarily at the finer scales the Argonne, Livermore and Slack SFAs we really had to tap into what we had learned the year before or I mean sorry the spring before in our workshop and we, we uh, put on our empathy goggles um, you know we we tuned up our active listening and we really actually did sit down and interview and talk to um, the, the leads and the scientists and find out what they were doing and what they really needed. And what we learned um, was they actually needed something that we had kind of taken for granted. We, uh, you know, we were sort of taking for granted. We had a fundamental understanding of the finer scales and we had these, these well-established reaction um, network engines or reactive transport codes that we could use. We really were taking it for granted that they they had everything, and of course they don't have everything. And uh, the research that's ongoing in those SFAs really needed some advances in those. They needed us to connect to uh, across to the molecular scales to K-base, which we're doing through one of the projects. Needed new um, reaction pathways, multiple pathways, and various uh, other features added, um, enhancements to the geochemistry engines. And so we reestablished this essential cornerstone of SBR science in the reaction network scale. And this is something that really wouldn't have happened, I think, without taking the time to do those interviews and taking the time to tap into uh, what we had learned uh, through the workshop last year with the, with the uh, Kate and, and Matt and their design challenge exercises. So I would say that our, we're, we're getting much closer to a complete picture, uh, so to speak. We've got um, a lot of confidence and we're continuing to improve our Agile. Uh, methodologies and processing processes and um, build uh, and enrich our use cases and partnerships with teams in new ways um, but but a lot of that is by adding in sort of mixing in this additional um, tools and and uh, processes that come uh, from the design thinking side of things that's really you know adding the empathy adding the active listening on the front end 
um, and iteratively repeating that uh, really helps in the problem framing and uh, ideation exercises. So um, really, really excited about continuing to learn more about this and to work with all of you um, in workshops and across your projects on these kinds of things. So thanks. Great, thanks David. So um, James Hubbard is up next and he's gonna share his uh, a pretty major project, Wonder, is with us. James, whenever you're ready, go ahead and share your screen. Okay, um, let's see. Are you guys hearing me? Can you see my slide? Okay, good. Okay, so I'm going to talk about uh, a vision we've been developing uh, called Open Watersheds by Design. It's really an outcome of a workshop that we held in late January. And beyond that, really a continuum of activities, including a series of webinars of, uh, of sort of active listening, as, as David was saying, and an open white paper call, a lot of discussion and deliberation since that January webinar. Um, and uh, one thing I want to emphasize is that um, open watersheds, uh, we, when people hear watersheds, they often think, well, we're talking about hydrology, physical processes, and what we've been driving towards is a much more integrative perspective of being able to link molecular processes, biology, chemistry, with physical processes across scales in, in a watershed context and with, uh, with the community in a coordinated and integrated way. And so what I'm going to do is take you through uh, just a, a couple pieces of, of some, some key motivation and challenges, and then sort of more fully flesh out what's meant by open watersheds by design as a concept. And, oh, there we go. And so first thing about the challenge that we're trying to address here is, is emphasized by this graphic here. And so these are these uh, lo the locations of SBR watershed test beds. Uh, there's five of them across the US. And really the key challenge that we're trying to address is the need to generate transferable data knowledge and models that can move nimbly across systems. And kind of similarly in parallel to what David was saying uh, about silos of software, in some ways these watershed test beds are a bit siloed in terms of data. And so there's a real need to move beyond that. And uh, it's all, and it's not just SBR that has a limitation. This is a map of some of the NSF infrastructure, such as their critical zone observatories. And that's a network of sites, but also, you know, they're, they're going deep into process understanding, but they're kind of, they're not truly linked together in a really integrated and interoperable way. Um, the the uh, NEON network, the National Ecological Observatory Network, is different than that. It is linked together. It's also mapped out here. Um, but it's, primarily a monitoring network, not so focused on process understanding. So there's a real need to kind of overcome existing limitations by linking deep process knowledge with broad understanding, broad monitoring uh, towards transferable data knowledge and models. And to emphasize this a little bit more, on the DOE side, the SBR side specifically, these watershed test beds, uh, they are a real strength, but also the, the current structures is a limitation where in these test beds, we do a lot of detailed process-based work um, linking together physical, chemical, biological processes across a broad range of scales. And this picture is from one of the test beds. This is Southeast Washington State. This is the PNNL uh, SBR project. This is our primary field location. And we do this. We go from fine molecular characterization up to watershed scale models, a lot of data model integration. Um, and that's good and it's powerful. And the same can be said of the other SFAs and their field sites for sure. Uh, and that's good and powerful, but the integration mostly is happening within sites. It's a bit of a silo is kind of what I was saying uh, on, on the previous slide. And so recognizing this limitation and how do we start to go beyond this? And this is that we're driving towards this vision of open watersheds by design as a way to move beyond this, to be more purposeful in how we build research programs to be, to be coordinated, to be interoperable um, uh, and connected to each other. And so this slide here, is meant to kind of summarize uh, the sort of the high level vision of, of, of moving from the left hand side here from dots on a map that are all good and useful but not terribly coordinated or integrated together and kind of missing some opportunities towards a paradigm of multi-scale 
um, physical, chemical, biological integration in a watershed context done with the community in a coordinated and integrated way. And we believe that we can do this uh, by leveraging um, open science by design methodologies and perspectives. Paul had this, uh, this um, report cover here in the bottom of my slide, uh, on one of his slides. We can use that methodology to address uh, scientific challenges uh, some of which are called out on the biological and environmental sides by the advisory committee to DOE called BRAC. This is a cover of one of their reports. In an iterative design-based uh, process that links together really an impressive suite of capabilities and, uh, and agencies that already exist and are kind of primed to, to do this coordinated integration with the right forethought and governance that, it, that can be achieved through design-based thinking. And so to say a little bit more about what I mean by open watersheds by design, let's kind of go through these terms. On the design side, you've been hearing about this. Um, let's kind of reiterate some of what's already been said in a way, is to, to use these methodologies uh, to build out research programs in purposeful ways, a priori, so that they are interoperable, they're, they're connected. To move beyond the, the, the sort of standard paradigm where researchers build, write a proposal, get it funded, and build out a research program principally to you know, generate their, the, the papers that they're generating to study their We can do better than that um, and, and in order to make our, the outcomes of our studies more interoperable uh, with others uh, so, so they can be leveraged towards uh, broader outcomes. And to do that in a way that ascribes, it kind of builds from um, key principles of open science that we'll talk about in just a moment, but linking those key principles and, 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 and building programs that ascribe to those principles using iterative design, test, build, learn methodologies, agile methodology uh, methodologies with a user-focused, community uh, sort of focused, human-centric uh, perspective. Dave was talking about the empathy goggles and active listening and understanding who needs what and how they're impacted by what you're doing uh, can be really impactful for how you build and uh, build that research program. So it's taking that design approach, but as I was saying, building programs that um, embody or ascribe to key design principles, if you will, such that, and these are two, um, two bodies or two, two elements of, of those design principles, the, the acronym of ICON and FAIR. So ICON stands for integrated in the sense that we're purposefully putting together physical, chemical, biological processes to, for, for collective holistic understanding. Coordinated means using consistent methodologies across systems in a purposeful way. Open itself is in the acronym, and really that uh, ties into the FAIR principles that are listed below, which have to do with uh, how making sure your data are findable, accessible, interoperable, and reusable. Too often we think we're being open by putting our data, say, up on a Figshare or something, but if we haven't structured it in the right way, it's maybe not super machine readable or hasn't ascribed to community standards. It's not really usable by anyone, which questions, is it truly open? And so that's super important. And also networked is, is the, the perspective uh, or the principle that work is done across systems with the community. It's not a single researcher in their one system or even a single researcher going across systems on their own, but doing this in a collective and integrated way. And of course the watersheds piece, probably preaching to the choir here, but you know, that's, a, that's really critical in the sense that we're taking design methods open principles, and, and building out this vision in a watershed context, though the approach is agnostic to the kind of system that one applies it to. But watersheds, of course, are quite critical and a natural place to, uh, to work in, the, in this way in that they, they fundamentally integrate physical, chemical, biological processes across terrestrial landscapes, the organized terrestrial landscapes, the outcome of processes from watersheds have major impacts on society with respect to water quality, water availability, environmental health, and of course, influence fluxes that uh, impact a broader Earth system. And so as sort of a, a tangible example, uh, and one of the catalysts that led us towards this vision of open watersheds by design, just briefly go over uh, this Wonders Consortium that's been mentioned a couple of times. I know many of you are aware of this already, but just to kind of go over it again, we think about Wonders as an example of coordinated open science uh, by design, a little bit of a different way of saying kind of the same thing, where we were in our field site. This is a, a, a piece of the PNNL SBR project, and we were in that field site. I showed you an image of that previously. We've been in that field site for a long time, 
and recognizing the challenge, we need to generate data, knowledge, and models that are transferable across systems. We needed a way to start to have a broader understanding of processes and data structures beyond our particular system. And so we built Wonders to enable that. This is in response to that need. And Wonders is it, it's, it's a global consortium and it's built to be mutualistic with the scientific community. Uh, it ascribes to ICON principles. It ascribes to FAIR principles. We make our data open and structured using community standards. We provide resources to the community uh, so they can provide samples back to us, data back to us. Um, and those data that we've chosen, to, that, that, we, that we focus on, are not just for monitoring purposes. This is where it's a little bit different than something like NEON. We're picking data types that we specifically need to inform uh, the mechanistic models that we are developing, in particular reactor transport models. Um, so this is kind of a different way of doing science where um, we're, we're providing resource to the community and they're mutualistically providing information back to us, but they also um, are, 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 are gaining benefits from engaging with us. Kind of going back to what David was saying about um, being able to articulate value to the community. That's been a, a really key point that we focused on as we designed and built Wonders. And so this is, provide a sense of this in a little bit different way. Um, this is a slide that's meant to parallel the slide I had a, a, few, a few slides ago, where in the Wonders case, we're going from this one particular field site, recognizing a need to have broader understanding, transferable understanding across systems, and doing that by using open science by design methodology to address scientific challenges and link Wonders purposefully into this sort of ecosystem of, of capabilities and expertise within DOE and beyond to really ultimately do together what would be impossible to do alone. And this, I'm uh, putting up some pictures here of folks sampling uh, for wonders across, uh, across the world, just to emphasize that wonders only exists, is only successful through engagement with the community. We, this is not something we're just doing on our own. And to be able to do that, we put a lot of thought into how to structure this uh, to be able to engage with the community. There's so many details uh, and governance that, that are needed to actually pull this off. We can only do that with a, a lot of forethought. It's not something you can do post hoc. So this is my last slide. Um, I'm just going to leave it up there in case people want to come back and think about what this vision is. And Sujata, I'll leave it there. Great, thanks. Thanks, James. Uh, is everyone able to hear me? I know that there was some sound issue earlier. Uh, if you're having trouble hearing me, please do uh, uh, kind of message in the chat window. I am trying to make adjustments as needed. So we're going to go into our um, design exercise with Kate. So Kate, you're on. So uh, James, can you uh, stop sharing your window? There you go. Can everyone hear me? Uh, it's a little soft, Kate, so uh, maybe you can get closer to the mic. Sure. Is that better? Yes. Okay. Hi, everyone. This is Kate in real time. Um, I am, let's see. Okay. Uh, so we heard some examples of design principles being brought to bear on several different problems. And so I wanted to do a slightly deeper dive with the group about problem definition um, from a design perspective. And so what we'll do is a, a quick walkthrough. And then at the end, I'm hoping that everyone can take a few minutes to share your problem statements with me so we can include them in the design of our breakout session at the SBR PI meeting. Um, and even if you're not going to be there, but you still want to share what you've done, um, that would be wonderful. We would love to have all of that feedback from the community in the spirit of, of open design. Um, so all you'll need here is a paper and a pencil. And so as scientists, we all know the importance of framing a problem. And I think one of the most um, masterful thinkers of our time Albert Einstein phrased this really nicely. So he said that the formulation of a problem is often more essential than its solution. Then, and, you know, the solution may be merely a matter of mathematical or experimental skill. 
So to raise new questions, new problems, to regard old problems from a new angle requires creative imagination and marks real advance in science. And you know, so one of the things that has started to drive me crazy since I've you know been involved in design is that you know, particularly in university settings and committees in particular, it, it turns out that we tend to start solving the problem before we've actually defined it. And you know, this can end up with knee-jerk policies, spending a lot of effort on things that don't actually address a real problem. And so there's a lot of interest in really honing in on ways to define problems. And, and so what I want to share with you today is a simple trick that we've been developing for problem definition. Um, you know, I think as scientists, we're less prone to jumping to a solution. Um, but I think it's all a skill that we can hone. And so this is one way to just think about defining problems. Um, but first, I wanted to start by placing the, the process of problem framing uh, in perspective. And so you heard a lot about design thinking as a process. Um, what is this process? So often the design process is represented by some linear arrangement of steps similar to what's shown here. So in, in human-centered design, you might start with empathizing. This is really just about doing a deep dive into what a particular person is thinking about or what a group is worried about, what are their problems. After that deep dive into how people are thinking and, and the challenges they're facing is really a synthesis phase where we try to make sense of, of what they've told us. And then we go to the, the problem definition or this hypothesis phase where we're really trying to think about you know, what is the, the, the nature of the problem. And we're really trying to go a couple levels beneath what they actually might have told us directly, infer meaning and, and information. And then, of course, we might ideate to develop some potential solutions to the problem and then go through a process of prototyping, iterating on the prototype. And then eventually, we hopefully get to a point where we can share um, this new product or this new design. And so you, you heard a lot about this example from, from David of, of working through this, this process. Um, so you might be thinking that this sounds pretty obvious. And you would be completely right. This is more or less a mirror image of the scientific method. And you know, of course, some of the differences might be to a scientist. The empathy phase is really about reading the literature and observing what are the, the key problems that people are struggling to, to, to um, solve. Um, and so synthesis might be making sense of a, you know, a vast body of scientific literature or what you're hearing at conferences and, and all of the different information streams that you're gathering together. Um, but so I wanted to make the point that that really design process is, is in itself um, a restatement of the scientific method and something we're all very, very familiar with. So then the next question is, if design is just the scientific method, what is all this excited, so excitement about? Why are we so excited about design, bringing design into science? And I think as I mentioned in the interview, you can follow these hexagons perfectly, but that will not make you the next Einstein. And so what design really is, is a set of met mindsets, um, methods, and behaviors that enable us to move flexibly through the set of hexagons and to arrange them in ways that best fit our problem, right? In many cases, we never follow this. In most cases, we never follow this linear method of, of, um, of science. And so one of the ways that we, we think about doing that and, and what really enables us to be good scientists is the abilities that we, we bring into the scientific method. And so what I've highlighted here are just a couple of the design abilities. And so this is just three of eight abilities that uh, are defined for design. And so, for example, the process between learning from, learning from people, empathy, and developing and testing a prototype really involves the ability to learn from others. Um, taking an idea and creating a prototype might be about building and crafting intentionally. So David Moulton talked about how they had started with this, let's build great software and people will use it, and had to transition into you know, bringing in the scientific community and the needs of the scientific community. So transitioning between 
form and function is, is a way to think about that, as well as communicating deliberately. That's so important to scientists, um, but also really important from a design perspective. And so I mentioned a reference down at the bottom, uh, Carissa Carter, who I mentioned in the interview, has a really nice uh, Medium article on the D-School publication, just outlining what the abilities are and why we think they're important. Um, the other thing I really like about thinking of design as a set of abilities is that it suggests we can improve them. And so I'm really interested in experimenting with how we can use this idea of abilities to train students because it gives us a way to talk about how we work. Um, it basically makes an invisible process visible. And so again, I, I want to zoom into this hypothesized step or the, the step of design that is about problem definition and problem framing. And what I hope everyone will do is just find a piece of paper and think about a problem associated with a scientific question you're presently focused on. And basically just write down the problem is fill in the blank. And so I've pulled a couple of examples here from the open watershed. Um, watershed research is fragments, fragmented. The problem is we can't integrate from multiple users to test models. The problem is watersheds are too complex for continental scale simulation of water quality. And so this is hard because I can't look over everyone's shoulders, but just take a few seconds to write down uh, a problem you're interested in. Okay, so the problem I'm going to workshop with is this one at the bottom that watersheds are too complex for continental scale simulation of water quality. Okay, so another time where I wish I could see everyone, but how many people in writing their problem statement included a need? Um, this comes up very frequently, I'm guessing that maybe about half of us wrote a problem statement that included the word need or requirement or some type of um, word that, that has a similar meaning. And so this is one of the, the big tricks in problem framing is that the second you write a problem statement in terms of a need, you immediately have jumped to solution and you're constraining the solution space that's available to you. And so if you think about this, a really simple example would be if the founders of Uber had posed a problem in terms of people need better taxis, we would not have ended up with ride sharing. And so leaving needs out of your problem statement is one of the, the tricks that we use to, to help open up the solution space so we can get to innovative new problem statements and solutions. Um, so don't state a need as a problem the first important point. The second thing I would like everyone to do is to think about the things that are causing the problem. Um, and so this, here's some examples here, and, and just write this as a problem statement. So the problem is that numerical simulation to capture dynamic responses is too complicated. So go ahead and write down two or three things that are causing the problem. And so the third part of problem definition, so write the problem statement, write a problem statement that includes the causes. So hopefully you now have about three different problem statements that are different views on the question you want to address. The third part are constraints. And I like the analogy of lenses, because if you think about the picture you take with a telephoto lens is a very particular type of photo. If you take 
a picture with a different type of lens. It's a very specific type of photo. And so constraints are really important in terms of framing the, the problem. And so you could think about in your particular question, your workshopping, is a constraint that we have zero dollars to spend or very resource limited. Um, maybe another constraint would be that we have to use existing expertise. And so these constraints are really important in terms of framing the problem. And so some different constraints you can think about are, you know, leverage. Do you have the ability to actually change the problem? Um, influence, abilities, consequences, resources. These are all different constraints that might be relevant to your problem. And so what you can do, and I'm gonna go ahead and just skip this step and hope people can kind of go back and, and do it later so we can leave time for questions. But the point is to go back and apply these constraints to those problem states that you just wrote. And so if my problem statement is that numerical simulation to capture dynamic responses is too complicated, it actually implies that current models can do this, and so that might not make it the problem I want to solve, right? Um, we can look at the second one where, you know, I don't have the expertise or money to work this out because I'm making the assumption that, you know, knowing where water goes, not just how fast it goes there, would take a lot of money and data and expertise that we don't have. And we can look at the third problem, and this one is the idea that reactions are driven by local conditions. And so I may not have the abilities or resources to work this out, but I might. And so here we could start to actually scope down the different questions that we might be able to address. We could limit the first two because one is not actually a problem in, in our framework, and um, one, we don't have the resources to work it out. You can also just use the constraints to actually write the problem statement. And so here's an example of just taking that constraint of needing to do this with the resources we have and rewriting it. And so we could reframe this as the problem is we don't have the right maps of the subsurface. So this is just an example I, I chose, but hopefully this trick will, will lead you to some new ways to look at your problem. And as I said earlier, reframing problems and bringing in constraints and causes are the way to frame your problem can really move you from the obvious solutions. And so the obvious solutions for some of my original problem statements were new and better models, new satellites, more data. And it moved us into something that at least I hadn't thought about, which is how might we create new subsurface maps for water quality models. And so the idea here is to get that solution space um, as broad as possible and to move from what might be obvious to less obvious solutions, just in how you frame the problem. And so the way that we think about problem definition is that it's caused by something else. It's also constrained by something else. And that using these causes and constraints to reframe problems can lead to unexpected and hopefully innovative solutions. And so I would love everyone to take some time now, the last five minutes, to just explore um, applying these constraints and causes to reframing your question. Sometimes it takes a lot of iteration. And then when you have one you like and you think is interesting, please email it to me and we'll use it at the SBR breakout session. Uh, so Great. that all I have, and I will turn it back to Sujata. Great, thank you, Kate, so much for uh, sharing that uh, exercise that I hope everyone can actually, um, there will be a recording of this webinar, so you can uh, hopefully use this exercise uh, in your own work. And uh, as Kate mentioned, we are actually going to be doing some design exercises at the SBR Town Hall during the ESS Dive PI meeting. So we hope that um, those of you who are part of the SBR program and PIs with us will be able to uh, really engage more deeply with uh, design thinking and apply it to some uh, SBR related challenges, problems, and have more open and integrated solutions as uh, as we've talked about today and that SBR is currently 
very engaged with to uh, advance SDR science. Um, we haven't received any specific questions yet, but please do type your questions into the window. Uh, even if you have to take off, uh, we will definitely uh, have like a little document that will be shared to answer your questions. So um, so I'm not seeing any questions yet, but feel free to uh, share them with me. You've got the Twitter handle uh, at Open Watershed, and you've also got uh, you can use the hashtag hash, uh, design for scientists on your Twitter handle. So um, I'll wait another few seconds, but if there's no questions, um, uh, we will probably end this webinar then. Okay, so seeing no questions coming up yet. I guess then we'll say uh, bye to everybody and uh, remember that um, this, this, you know, there's lots of information online, but if you have questions, uh, you can email Kate Marr or Jane Stegan uh, or David Moulton or myself, and we'd be happy to direct you to the right uh, resources or some interesting resources. And otherwise, we'll hope to see you during the SDR town hall and breakout sessions at the ESS PI meeting. Okay, take care, everybody. Bye.